um, why I organized this uh, program and why this particular speaker. Uh, I can talk about that for a semester. I teach a course on almost that subject. Uh, but I would mention a few things, and then I introduce the, um, the speaker tonight. Um, for those of us who were in academia for a long time, one issue which was always uh, part of at least my training in general was that um, religion and spirituality uh, is either very private or it's on its way out. This was part of the modernization theory and modernity as a social science. We were told that um, as modernity comes, religion goes out. I think Professor Huntington told us a long time ago before it, uh, he became famous to reintroduce religion in world politics again. So for that reason, I would argue that um, not only religion is back, it never left, but more than ever before, it is part of the public life and also part of the political life, both here and abroad. Since the Iranian Revolution in 1979, uh, the role of religion in war politics has changed. In fact, the, one of the most important factors in shaping international politics today is the preoccupation of not only people in the third world in looking into religion as a force of political mobilization, uh, cultural revitalization, cultural revival, but also a major preoccupation for the Western world or the Christian world in dealing with the rest of the humanity, especially when it comes to the Islamic world. So for that reason alone, that is the reemergence of the role of religion in world politics, I think we have enough justification to have this gathering. But more important than that perhaps is the future of an emerging community in the United States and in the West in general, and particularly in the United States, the Muslim community, and how it relates to its broader uh, community called the Christian, Judeo-Christian community in the United States. And how that interaction between these two communities would have an impact on the American perceptions of the world and how they behave not only internationally but also towards this new emerging community in the United States. And no other person, I think, in this world that I know is more qualified to talk about this subject than our guest speaker tonight, uh, John Esposito. Um, I don't know how to introduce him, so I would do justice to his contribution. I can talk about his books. He has about 20 books, I think. Um, I can talk about his academic background, his degrees, but I think perhaps more than anything else, I see him as a person who has dedicated his life to a better understanding between two important communities, not only here, but around the globe. And I would say this with certainty, that his contribution to the Muslim community in particular in the United States and abroad has been, has been more than any other Muslim scholar or otherwise in the last 10 years. He is professor of religion and international affairs and professor of Islamic studies. He is founding director of Muslim Christian Understanding at Georgetown University. Uh, he got his degree in 1974 from Temple University in Islamic Studies and Comparative Religion. Uh, some of his most famous uh, books that many of you who are my students know by heart. Uh, Islam and Politics, fourth edition. Islam, the Straight Path, 
uh, which considered to be one of the best introduction book to Islam by a non-Muslim. Islam, Gender and Social Change, Political Islam Revolution, Radicalism or Reform, Religion and Global Order, Islam and Democracy, and I would say one of his most important contribution is the Oxford Encyclopedia of the Modern Islamic World, which is in the fourth volume, and I'm hoping that future volumes would come out pretty soon. I don't want to waste your time and embarrass him, although he told me yesterday that he would not be embarrassed easily. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce you a, a great friend and a great scholar and a man of wisdom, John Esposito. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I appreciate that uh, very generous introduction. <clears throat> you know, I was thinking when I was sitting in the audience um, how much things have changed. In 1967, when I first went to graduate school for a doctorate, um, the chairman of the department suggested that I take a course in Islam. And I remember my, my reaction was, why? Uh, I knew very little about Islam, I knew very little about Arabs, and what I knew didn't necessarily motivate me to want to learn more. And then I began to study with one of the Muslim professors who came there and decided that I was going to get my doctorate, uh, to which the reaction was, on the part of my mother, you'll never get a job. She was very close to correct on that. Uh, on the part of my colleagues, why would you ever do anything like that? You know, they called it going into the abracadabra field, uh, training yourself. I, I used to kid and say in those days it was like announcing to your mother you were going to be a shepherd in the United States or in New York. I mean, it, it, was just, it just didn't make any sense at all. At a certain point, my mother asked me to ask my professor, my Muslim professor, what his children were going to be. And he had five children. Uh, this was Ismail al furqi and Ismail told me what he wanted his children to be, since I told my mother, you know, physician, scientist, engineer. And so my mother said, now go back and tell him if none of his children are going to be scholars of Islam, why does she want an Italian-American Catholic to study Islam and to be unemployed? So uh, as I grew up in New York, which is a very cosmopolitan area, for as far as you could walk, there were no mosques. One didn't even have a sense of a mosque. If you thought of a mosque, it was something that was overseas. If you did think of a Muslim, it was somebody who was overseas. When I finished my degree in 1974, I discovered what it meant to go into near unemployment. And it was for five or six years in which there was absolutely no interest in Islam. I obtained a job teaching everything but Islam. I would send out book proposals, maybe 100, 97 wouldn't answer. The other three would say, great idea, but there's no market. If you looked at most colleges and universities, you didn't find Islam in the curriculum. High schools and grammar schools, forget it. And look at where we are today, only 20, 25, 30 years later. I have trouble saying 30 years later. It sort of ages me, so I'll say 20, 25, 30 years later. We no longer talk about Islam in the West. We have to talk about Islam in the West. Within my center, we have a special division or program. In fact, we have a, uh, a conference coming up in April it's actually, the conference is being called Muslims of the Diaspora. We decided not just talking about sort of Muslims in the West. We have Islam as the second or third largest religion in the United States and in Europe. So it's not only Islam as a global reality, 1.2 billion Muslims, more than 56 Muslim countries, but Islam is now part and parcel of the United States and of Europe. As I like to say, it's late in coming and late in realization, but in many ways, to use poor syntax in English, Muslims are us. Not just us as part of the global community, us as Americans, or it would be us as Brits, us as French citizens. This is indeed a remarkable reality. How are we going to respond to this? How will we all respond to this? How will we 
face the reality that Islam is both a global and domestic presence and a global and domestic force and therefore a global and domestic challenge. I'm going to talk about it at two levels. One in terms of, if you will, uh, Muslim-Christian relations globally. And then because I can never resist it when I have a fair number of Muslims in the audience, I will talk about the challenge as I see it to the Muslim community. Something which I'm often invited to do and uh, something which I know that when people uh, don't like what I hear, then they say, why do we need to listen to him? He's not a Muslim. So it's a sort of interesting, you're in a very good situation. If you like what I say, you can say, it's amazing how a non-Muslim can, you know? The Kufa got it right. On the other hand, if you don't like it, you can say, aha, what do you expect from him? If you want to understand the challenge, I would put it in terms of two phrases. Those who speak of a clash of civilizations and those who talk about a civilizational dialogue. About five or six years ago, as I was watching the Gulf War unfold, I was very concerned about this notion of clash of civilizations. Huntington had not written his piece yet, but I just had a sense that the way things were shaping up, there was this danger. And I wrote a book called The Islamic Threat, Myth or Reality. But I remember having the concern, as the book was with the publisher, it hadn't come out yet, that maybe I was wrong. Maybe this sense of confrontation was going to pass. You know, the Gulf War would pass and somehow everything would be wonderful. And in fact, that kind of issue or challenge is out there. On the other hand, in the last five years, the first major speaker at our center, in addition to the uh, Ayatollah who visited me the first day I opened the center five years ago, about a half hour after I opened the center, and caused all kinds of comments throughout the School of Foreign Service, even though it's a school of international affairs. People just couldn't, um, couldn't believe that we had an Ayatollah walking into the building, let alone coming down to my, my center. And I remember sticking my head out the door and saying, there's a new boy in town. We've got a new approach in, you know, in the university. But then we had Anwar Ibrahim come, the Deputy Prime Minister of Malaysia. And the, he gave a major address, received the Presidential Medal, and it was called Towards a Civilizational Dialogue. And more recently, as you know, President Khatami of Iran has talked about civilizational dialogue. And so we have those two options out there. And those options, therefore, are not only being discussed within the West, but they are being discussed among Muslim leaders in terms of relations between the Muslim world and the West. What can we say about the relationship of Islam and the West, past and present? On the one hand, it's a difficult topic to talk about because both sides have their perception of the other. Both sides have engaged, as indeed Iran and the United States has engaged for the last 20 years, in a process of mutual Satanization, in a process at times of mutual demonization. From the early spread and expansion of Islam to the Crusades, to the Inquisition, to the Ottoman Empire, to European colonialism, to the Cold War, to the post-Cold War, there have indeed been points of conflict and confrontation. No one can deny that, and I will talk about them tonight. But you will note when I get to the 21st century, the question is whether we're going to choose to move beyond them or to just stay comfortably talking about them. But those points of conflict and confrontation have been there. And the irony is, the conflict and confrontation came not only because of differences, they came because of similarities. The very similarities that I will argue become the basis for moving forward together were, in the old days, reasons for confrontation or taken that way. The spread of Islam was taken as a theological, political, and civilizational threat by Western Christendom. Why? Theologically, it would sound like we were talking about similarities. Muslims believed in the one true God, as do Christians and Jews. Muslims believed in a long line of prophets. They believed in revelation to Moses, to Jesus, and one final time to the prophet Muhammad. They believed in accountability and responsibility in life, social justice, family values, 
And they believed, if you will, in eternal accountability, heaven and hell. And yet this itself became a source for conflict. Again, why? If Christians were comfortable in saying that Christianity had come to succeed Judaism, that the revelation had somehow been distorted and now there would be a new revelation, Christians were not comfortable when Muslims came along and extended that same logic and said, we have one final revelation now coming to the Prophet Muhammad in the Quran. If Christians were comfortable in saying, our community has now been given a universal mission to spread God's will, they were challenged and threatened when Muslims came along and said, and God has now given that mission over to us. So in, a, in an interesting kind of way, theological similarities became a source for, in a sense, theological confrontation at times. Politically, obviously, the spread of Islam, the extent to which it overwhelmed Eastern Christianity, was seen as a threat. The extent to which it spread globally, it was seen as a competitive threat. And of course, civilizationally and culturally, this was the case. And yet, there were many points of cooperation. These points of cooperation, and indeed of civilizational dialogue, are too easily passed over. Part of that is that in many ways we are more comfortable. You know, we can criticize the media today for being concerned about headline events and conflict, and you put the media on and they don't talk about what's good, they just put it on and all you see are the murders and the crimes. But in fact, that's what human nature is also attracted to. The media wouldn't be doing it if people didn't look for it. And that's what sells books, and that's what sells TV shows, and that's what grabs people's interest. And so in a strange kind of way, we engage in that ourselves. You know, when we talk about our civilizational and historical past, we see the points of conflict, we often don't talk, talk about the points of cooperation. As Islam spread, Christians and Jews played a major role in the Islamic empire. That's a major part of history. Some are aware of it, most aren't. As Islam developed its great civilization and culture, it would have never been done without Muslims learning from Western philosophy and science and mathematics and then building on that, as well as obviously also drawing off in their, in their primary, if you will, uh, disciplines and sciences, Quranic studies, studies of Hadith, Sharia, usul al fiqh, etc. But in terms of that civilizational dialogue, it was very much there. It's very interesting that today is March 7th. If I have it right, and I cannot believe this, my mother would be so happy. Today is the feast of St. Thomas Aquinas. St. Thomas Aquinas is one of the great Christian and Catholic theologians and philosophers of all times. Thomas Aquinas was able to be the philosopher and theologian that he was because his, he not only Thomas Aquinas, but his teacher drew heavily off Arab and Islamic thought and culture. That kind of confluence is often overlooked. Those points of, of, of contact and cooperation are often overlooked. And indeed, part of the problem we have is that we often see the world in, in terms of either or. Rather than saying there are points of conflict, there are points of cooperation, what can we learn from it? How do we move forward? But what about the 21st century? What about Muslim-Christian relations in the 21st century? Well, that gets kind of interesting and tricky. I will say some things that to some in the audience may be obvious, but my experience is that they are not to neither the average Muslim that I come across nor the average American. They know part of what I say, but they don't understand the way in which I'm going to frame what I say. To understand Muslim-Christian relations today in the 21st century, to understand the relationship, if you will, of Islam and the West and of Muslims in the West with, let's say, Jewish and Christian communities, one has to appreciate a couple of major, not just facts, but in a sense, see them as realities and experiences. 
both Muslims and Christians bring to bear their historical baggage. When I was a young scholar, I was on a panel at the, at the University of Chicago. And Fazul Rahman, one of the great Muslim scholars of the 20th century, teaching at the University of Chicago, chaired the session. And I had to catch a plane to go home. And I was very nervous about being able to catch the plane to go home, and also nervous about how well I would come across because I was with three very senior scholars. And Fazul Rahman got up and he said, because I was the last one to speak, could I ask my brothers on the panel to skip over their denunciation of the Crusades and European colonialism and American neo-colonialism and get to the heart of their talk, whatever it is, so that Professor Esposito can have a chance to speak. What he was really saying was that no matter what your topic was, if you had a Muslim scholar, the Muslim scholar would begin by denouncing the past. You say, you know, and even if the talk had nothing to do with European colonialism, somehow it was connected to European colonialism or the Crusades, you know? And that, that's not to deny the, the reality of the past, but that was there. And similarly, one can talk about the other side. Well, the reality is that we both have that kind of baggage. And then something else happens. Most people forget that indeed most people in the West knew nothing about Islam or very little about Islam in the Muslim world. And that their knowledge, their engagement with Islam came primarily through the Iranian Revolution. That is a simple fact. And so the encounter of the West with Islam is an encounter, if you're an American, for example, of seeing the Shah of Iran, who was regarded in America, who would come with his wife, be on television. He dressed like us, talked like us, spoke good English, uh, was a modernizing Shah, uh, talked about bringing Iran into the 21st century overnight, was on all the talk shows, was hosted by Jimmy Carter six months before Iran fell. It was unthinkable that that Shah would be overthrown by, if you will, a bearded mullah, Ayatollah, the Ayatollah Khomeini, who was not only a strange figure, that is, no one had ever seen an Ayatollah, chances are in the US, but he also looked like an extremely old man because of his white beard, which is one of the reasons I took my beard off after 30 years. <laughs> I once said that to the Ayatollah Khomeini's daughter and she looked at me and said, because they showed my passport with this huge beard, she said, why'd you take it off? And I told that story and she said, it's the first time I went to Iran after the revolution, I was very nervous, she said, but I like men with white beards. And she was sitting under a picture of her father and I thought, my God, I'm never gonna get out of here. I've, I've just embarrassed myself. And then she just sort of moved her veil aside to show me she was smiling so I could relax. But in any case, for Americans, there's the picture of the Shah, there's the picture suddenly of this man. He not only overthrows the Shah, but overthrows him from where? A village in France. I mean, that's impossible. I mean, if you think about it logically, that that would happen. And, what was part of that process? The taking of American hostages. Every night Americans would put their TV on and they were told that not just Americans were held hostage, America was being held hostage. By whom? By the Muslims. And what did they see every day in the morning or the afternoon when they put on national television? People in the streets of Iran yelling death to America. Well, you know, if you're the average American sitting there and you see people grab your diplomats and they go on, every day you see them on TV yelling, death to America, death to America. You don't need much intelligence to say, they may mean it, you know? I mean, if I turned to my mother at that time and said, guess what, I'm going to go and see some of the mosques in Iran, my mother might have been just a little nervous about my security. <laughs> so this was the interaction. At the same time, Ronald Reagan when he came into the presidency, alongside the evil empire, put what? Gaddafi slash Khomeini. You remember the night that the United States bombed Libya? Reagan said, why are we doing it? It's Gaddafi, terrorism, and the worldwide Islamic fundamentalist movement. Dan, Dan Quayle, the vice president under Bush, speaking at the Naval Academy, said to the cadets, your job is to protect us from being caught off guard internationally by international threats like Nazism, communism, and Islamic fundamentalism. And so both in the minds of Americans, in the visions that they saw through the headline events on CNN, and from their senior political leaders, there was the sense that there were 1.2 billion Muslims, 
second largest religion in the world, but suddenly now there was this confrontation. And scenes from Lebanon of embassies being bombed and people hijacked reinforced that sense of, if you will, a clash of civilizations. The World Trade Center bombing, for many, had the sense of it's being brought home. As a result, ignorance, headline events, bury the complexities, the diversity of what's going on in the Muslim world. And so everything gets seen through the prism of, if you will, an Islamic threat equated with Iran slash Khomeini. You can see that nowhere more clearly than in the 1990s. Because if in the 1980s the fear was Iran's export of the revolution, both in the Middle East and to the wider world, or of radical groups such as the group that assassinated Sadat, in the 1990s when you have elections and you would think this is going to be fine, it's going to show that Islamists participate within the system, they are major social forces within society, developing institutions, they are major political forces. The reality of it is that many of the governments in the West, like many of the regimes in the Muslim world, were even more panicked because now it looked like Islamists were going to come to power through ballots, not bullets. The inability to deal with the reality of Islam and of Muslim societies. What does this mean in terms of the 21st century and relationships between the Muslim world and the West? And what does this mean to the Muslims of America and the Muslims in the West in general? The first thing is that we are now in a position and at a time as we face the 21st century where the wrong situation has created the right situation. What do I mean by that? Interest in Islam and the Muslim world did not come because people woke up in the 70s and said, gee, we didn't understand Islam, the second largest of the world's religion. We're all children of Abraham. Let's hold hands and learn something more. No, what it was was we have a geostrategic threat. We need to learn more about Islam and the Muslim world. But as a result of that, coverage of Islam in grammar school, in high school, in colleges and universities has exploded. There are virtually no major colleges or universities where Islam and the Muslim world are not to be found taught in the curriculum. Coverage of Islam in terms of publications, that situation has exploded. Do a search in your library for books on Islam and the Muslim world before the Iranian revolution and after. It is absolutely remarkable. If you want to see a really good example, take a look at my CV. I finished my degree in 1974. Between 74 and 79, I had four articles. That was it. From 1980 on, I have I don't know how many books. I don't know how many articles. Maybe, I don't know, whatever the numbers are. But they're fairly impressive. Not just because I'm impressive, but because, in quotes, there's a real interest out there. But we'd like to think the first is the more important one. But there is a real interest. I could publish a book every other day, and there would be a market for it. I could do a video series on Islam and the Muslim world, etc., etc. The interest is there. Now, it came about for the wrong reason, but a lot of good returns are actually coming in. There is far more of a knowledge of Islam and the Muslim world out there. At the same time, we still are faced with those who say, but in the post-Cold War, Islam represents the second largest religion. It provides the only ideological alternative. With the, you know, with the death of communism or the passing of communism. And so there's that potential challenge or danger of a clash. But at the same time, if you look, there are a whole generation of scholars and experts and political analysts who take the opposite position. And so when you see those who talk about a clash, you have many others who counter that. That situation did not exist 10 years ago. If you're in Washington, there, are, there is present in Washington now two schools of thought in general that deal with this issue. Not just as in my time, one school of thought. But again, where is the challenge? Who's being challenged? What are the responses? 
I want to move to the Muslim community very quickly, so I'm just going to make a couple of comments internationally. The challenge internationally is for Muslim countries, the vast majority of whose rulers are authoritarian, to indeed think about what is best for their people long term and to open up the system. It is for Muslim rulers to indeed show that they believe in self-determination, but here self-determination for their own people, to allow people to participate more politically, to allow people to choose the direction of their, their societies, to allow people to discuss and debate the role of religion in society, to avoid using repression as the only means to keep control, to develop what I would call the culture and institutions of civil society, of an open society, much as Mr. Khatami, for example, is calling for in Iran today. Without that, one will simply perpetuate authoritarianism, whether it's secular or religious. The challenge to Western governments is to walk the way they talk. That is, if Western governments are going to say that they believe in self-determination and democracy, then it must be for everyone. You can't have a double standard. You can't talk about the promotion of democracy in some parts of the world, but not in the Middle East and in many parts of the Muslim world. The challenge to those who say that they are committed to Islam socially and politically, to those who are called Islamic activists or Islamists, is to themselves show that they can walk the way they talk. If they want to ask for rights under a regime, they have to show that when they're in power and in authority, they will extend those same rights to others who disagree with them. They must show that they too can be self-critical. Self-critical not only of their excesses, but the excesses of others committed in the name of Islam. So self-determination and self-criticism are in fact what indeed Muslim countries, the West, Islamic activists, and indeed all of us are called in common to share. But in fact, what most of us tend to do is to compare our ideal to somebody else's reality. And that gets in our way. We look at somebody else and we see all their faults and we say, it's not our fault, it's their fault. We're beyond that. Christianity isn't like that, it's what Islam's about. Islam isn't like that, it's what Christianity's about. The West isn't like that, it's the way Muslims are. So each one is calling the other militant, each one is calling each other whatever, neo-colonialist, etc. That level of self-criticism is a very difficult thing to move to. Let me talk about the Muslim community. This is what I find to be much more fun. One of the things that you will find, for those of you who are younger, it's the only thing that's, that, that has any value to the idea of getting older. You know you're getting older when you suddenly reflect on something and say, I remember 20 or 30 years ago. The game's over once you do that. When I used to hear people say that, I always thought, my God, that's terrible. I, I hope I never get to that stage. Now I try to say it was 20 years instead of 30 years, 30 years instead of 40 years, etc. Yeah. The only thing I brag about is, is how long I've been married, which is 33 years. But anything, any, anything beyond that is a problem for me to, to deal with. But the reality of it is that when you get to this age, you can then say what you like, especially if you fly into a city and you know you're leaving the next morning. It's like watching, you know, the, the old westerns. You come into the town, you shoot up, and you leave at night. The only time it's a problem is if you're going to stay. But if, you, if, you, if people get upset, you still know you're going to leave. You're going to make it back to your hotel, hopefully. And uh, we won't say what hotel I'm at. And then you, you head off to whatever airport I'm flying out of. I know where you are. You know where I am. That's, that's the problem. I know. This Iranian connection is very dangerous. Uh, that's what they meant in the introduction. Um, you know, whenever I go to Iran, people somehow expect me to wear a tie. Now, normally I wear it the first time and then I take it off because I always want to announce when I'm in Iran wearing the tie. This makes everybody feel happy because they expect an American to wear it. On the other hand, it's the one thing that's illegal in Iran. <laughs> wearing a tie. I mean, that's what everybody always loves to say, you know. Oh, it's illegal to wear a tie, but please wear one because people expect you to as a, as a, as a Westerner <laughs> and a non-Muslim. What's the challenge in the 21st century in terms of Muslim Christian understanding, especially from the perspective of the Muslim community? I have been 
functioning within the Muslim community for about 30 years. Because my teachers were Muslim, because virtually everybody I studied with in graduate school, most of the grad students were Muslim. And therefore, I, in a sense, am probably one of the few non-Muslim uh, original members of things like the MSA and AMSS. I'm on more Muslim mailing lists than one can believe, including fundraising mailing lists. But the reality of it is that things have changed enormously. But the challenge to the Muslim community is, are you going to show in the 21st century that they have? Are you going to show that you're now at a second, third stage in, in development? The Muslim community today has the human and financial resources to make a difference. It did not have those resources 30 years ago, 20 years ago. You did not have the number of Muslims. You did not have the number of Muslim professionals. You did not have the number of successful Muslims in the professions, of educated Muslims, etc. cetera. Okay. Those human and financial resources are there. The question is whether or not that will be harnessed, whether or not that will be harnessed so that one functions effectively within the broader Muslim community of the United States and in interaction with the non-Muslim community in the United States. Let me make some general observation observations about Muslim-Christian relations. The most important thing is that the way in which Muslim-Christian relations really moves forward is not to start with what Muslims and Christians share in common religiously, but rather what they share in common socially. And I've never put it that way before, and I'll show you why. It's when you encounter the other in the workplace and in school and realize that the other, in many ways, is very much like me. When people encounter each other as neighbors and realize that they share a lot of concerns, that they are parents, they are concerned about their children, they are concerned about their neighborhoods, they are concerned about family values, they are concerned about education, about sex education, they are concerned about drugs, they are concerned about... It's when people actually work together side by side that they not only see the differences, but they see what they share in common as human beings and they also see a good deal of the values that they share in common. Then one can move to the next stage. If you start simply with the theological part of the problem is a lot of people I know are very devout, but they don't really know all that much about their religion. You know what I mean? They, they know a lot in terms of their devotion, but when they go to engage somebody from another faith to, to talk, they often don't know very much about the person's other faith, let alone about their, th themselves in terms of that level of sophistication, and they get bogged down. Now, but to move to the theological, allowing for the differences that that exists between Muslims and Christians, and that should exist and should be celebrated, the commonalities are staggering. The belief in God, prophets, revelation, the belief in family and social values, the concerns with secularism, materialism, etc., they are staggering. But often our differences get in the way of seeing the commonalities. That's one challenge. The second challenge is, as I said, to realize our common experience. The third challenge is, as I said earlier, not to compare our ideal to somebody else's reality. We should compare each other in terms of ideals, Christian ideals, Muslim ideals, realities. Christian realities, Muslim realities. Then we see our ideals and we see our problems that we share in common. Otherwise, we are to use an American phrase, stacking the deck against the other person. I'll just talk about my ideals and I'll deal with your reality. And so I can always retreat when you say, my God, look at what Christians have done or whatever. Say, That's not really Christianity. So that has nothing to do with it. Rather than saying that may not be Christianity, but indeed a lot of Christians engage in that. So the ability to talk, if we want to appreciate each other, about our shared ideals as well as our shared realities. In terms of the Muslim community itself, what are some observations that can be made? To me, this is the most important observation, both globally and domestically. Muslims have to not just reclaim Islam, they have to reclaim their self-confidence. When Islam spread in the early centuries, the reason why it was such a dynamic, interactive force in addition to talking about God's guidance in terms of Islam spreading, was that Muslims were self-confident. They felt that they were in control, so when they engaged other cultures and civilizations, 
they could interact and dialogue and borrow freely. There wasn't the concern of losing one's identity, of being co-opted, of being overpowered. Now, it's not to say that Muslims don't have a problem at times in some societies with the issue of being overwhelmed in terms of cultural penetration, etc. But in many other parts of the world, and in many situations, Muslims are a lot more established, empowered, than they allow themselves to be. Empowerment is very much something that is necessary in self-confidence. The danger with simply repeating the past and remembering the past, if you're not careful, is that you tend then to live in the past and not say, this is what the past was about, what can we learn from it? Thank God we're in a position to move beyond it. How do we build on that? Otherwise, we're still fighting the battles of the past and we're still feeling that we're not empowered, for example. When Italian Catholics came to the United States, they were a minority, religiously and ethnically. They were not accepted by the dominant group. They could not get into the best schools and universities. When my father went for a job in New York, it said blacks, Jews, and Italians need not apply. When I was a young man going to a beach in Massachusetts, I was told by someone, be a little careful because they don't like blacks, Puerto Ricans, and Italians. The community was faced with empowering itself. It had to think about how do we, as a minority community, raise our children in this majority community, educate them in a way in which they will not simply be overwhelmed by that majority experience? How do we, as a disenfranchised minority community, move into the positions of, if you will, power and authority within the society. I had a colleague I'd go to lunch with all the time. And he would always ask me the same questions. We would go, not all the time, we would go to lunch every three or four years. And he must have had a bad memory. Every three or four years we would sit down and he'd say to me, so John, how are you, how's your wife and the children? And I would say, I told you a long time ago that my wife and I decided not to have children. Oh, so John, how is your garden? And I'd look at him and say, my garden? He'd say, well, you know, your people have gardens. The Italians have gardens. H how are the zucchini? And I would say, we don't have a garden. We don't do zucchini. And then I would say, but I built a patio. And he'd say, ah, because Italians are good with cement. We build patios and we put people in cement. <laughs> and then I would say, no, 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 I didn't build a patio. I got gotcha. you. We don't do patios in my family either. Yeah, but you see, the image was that we were all trained not to go to university, not to move into top posi you know, positions, but yes, we could, we could be laborers, but never move beyond being laborers. Okay? That community has empowered itself. The Italian Catholic, Italian American community, Irish American community, Polish American community. Let's take a look at the Muslim community in America. The numbers of Muslims in America, I'm not even bothered going to get into. I do interviews on this. You call up six people, you get different statistics. But Islam is clearly the third largest religion in, Islam, in America. Muslims are now part of the fabric of society. Go to any major city, go to any town. There are mosques all over the place. I like to say the problem that the Muslim community has is in some Muslim communities, there are more mosques than there are Muslims which says something about ethnic problems in the Ummah, you know. But that's an issue that I may get to. Muslims are now part and parcel of the professions in the community. Both my parents have Muslim physicians. It's not because they say, ah, my son goes to the Muslim world, he writes on Islam, we should have a Muslim physician. Far from it. It's because in New York and New Jersey, Muslims are a significant presence. In Jersey City, there are so many Egyptians that, you know, in, in Arabic, um, you have a soft and then the hard G. So you can say Jama or you can say Gama. And the Egyptians refer to it as Gersey City with a hard G. 
I got into a cab in Jersey City and the cab driver had his Quran. And I began, I didn't know how to engage him to indicate that I knew a little something about Islam. So finally I, be, I began to recite the Shahada and I thought we were gonna have an accident. He spun his head around. You know? <laughs> and, and, and then we began to talk about the number of, of sort of not only Muslims, but you know, uh, uh, Egyptian Muslims and, and et cetera in the vicinity. So Muslims are very much there. They're in our universities, they're in our jobs, they're in our society. But the challenge of the Muslim community is where do you go from here? How do you marshal those resources to engage in institution building? How do Muslims build institutions? What do I mean by institutions? I mean institutions that represent Muslim concerns. Muslims need institutions in Washington and nationally that deal with issues like public affairs, the media, political lobbying, etc. So that people have a sense of the significance of the number of Muslims. Otherwise, it's as if the Muslim community is in a closet. Nobody knows they're there. If you are visible, that's what makes people in Washington listen to you. And only that. If you are a visible community, that's what makes the media respond. You call up the media and say, I found what you said about Islam offensive. I saw Jag last night and I didn't like it. They don't care. But you let them know that you're a significant number of people, then they do care. But that kind of monitoring of the media and responding, that kind of monitoring of the political system and responding can only come when you build institutions. The second thing is to train the next generation to move into the professions that allow for this kind of access. And that's happening. We see Muslims in the legal profession, medical profession, but it's going to become more and more important to see Muslims in politics, to see Muslims in communications. It's going to become more and more important to see Muslims not only studying medicine and engineering, but of all things, Islam, and actually getting degrees. I travel around the country, I speak to a lot of Muslim communities, and I meet with graduate students. And I'll just give you two or three stories to give you an idea of some of the problems the community faces. I was talking with one group, and the graduate student was saying to me in a major city, he said, the problem we have is with sometimes our parents' generation. I said, what's the problem? He said, they live in denial. I said, denial of what? They deny that they've been living in America for 30 years and that they're gonna die in America. And he said, and that has an impact on us in terms of how we define ourselves as Muslims in America. That's one issue. The second issue was of a group, a young group of, of Muslim graduate students in which three of them discovered that they shared something in common and it wasn't Islam. It was the fact that they were having a tremendous problem with their fathers. What was the problem? The three of them had switched out of medical school into Islamic studies. The fathers who were committed Muslims want their kids to be devout Muslims. They want them to be really employed and make big bucks. The idea that their kid was gonna leave medical school and get a PhD in Islamic studies was beyond them. You're gonna be a professor? Dealing with that reality. But unless the Muslim community develops that side of itself, how can it empower itself? Will the Muslim community always be looking where? Overseas for its understanding and interpretation of Islam? One of the things I learned early on as a scholar is that there is an ummah. And when Muslims react to certain international events, they react with a sense of commonality. But the other thing I learned is that the ummah also exists, but it doesn't exist in this sense. I went from one Muslim country where my wife and I we're living to another. And people said, why are you going there? This is the best possible place to be. Well, I said, but, you know, that's another Muslim country. It has, but, but we set the tone for the Islamic world. And in fact, our people go there and educate them. You see, that kind of little tension that then can get played out within the American experience and can weaken the Muslim community. That's what I meant by communities where you don't just have a kind of integrated Muslim community, which you have, and you have many of them here. I've seen them on the West Coast, I've seen them in Toledo, I've seen them in many communities. But in many others, when you land in a city, you can identify the mosques almost ethnically. You've got the Pakistani mosque, you've got the Turkish mosque, you've got the, now some of the mosques are filled and, and, and some of them aren't. Mobilizing and getting beyond that. Developing a community that has more cohesion, but also developing a community that's not only moving into some of the professions, but all of the professions. So that when one faces the kind of religious questions that one has to face in terms of the adaptation, if you will, 
an encounter of Islam with the American scene, you actually have Muslims who not only know their Islam, but know America. Too often you have some who know Islam, but don't know America very well, who just come over here. You have those that know America, but don't know Islam very well. Now, don't be offended when I say don't know Islam very well. What I mean is that one can know Islam devotionally, but not know it in terms of the kind of intellectual resources that one needs for interpretation. I like to say that Muslims, Jews, and Christians have shared an experience as they adapt to America, and, and even internationally. You move into, the, into modern education, and what happens is people get, grow up and get an education university level. But for many, their religious knowledge stays at the same level that they had as children. You know, so they become, if you will, PhD physicists, but their knowledge of Islam is still here in terms of their knowledge of Sharia, their knowledge of Islamic history, their knowledge of etc. And unless one really understands the realities of one's faith and history and its tremendous, the tremendous dynamism of Islam and how that dynamic played out, how Islam both pre preserved its essentials but also was dynamic enough to interact with other cultures, to transform them, to borrow from them, etc., one cannot move forward. Let me bring this uh, talk to a conclusion. Although somebody told me that Ataturk gave his famous six-day talk. I thought that was very interesting. I'd like to try that sometime. Go ahead. You know, I mean, that's, that was. Oh, also, another example of how Muslims have become excessively Americanized. I spoke at an ISNA meeting years ago. There were about 5,000 Muslims. And I got up and I said, relax, sit back. This talk may go 30 minutes. It may go three hours. People were immediately going like this. And I said, you know, 25 years ago when I went out in the Muslim world to talk, nobody was looking like this. In fact, when I was in Iran recently, uh, the uh, Minister of Culture began a conference that I was speaking on, on Islam and civil society, and he said, maybe if we're going to have a civil society here, one of the first things we should do to be civil is to start on time. I've noticed we're not starting anything on time, he was commenting. It seems to me that as the Muslim community defines itself in the 21st century and moves forward, the challenge really will be how to harness those resources. Now, I can say that and you can sit there and say we're going to do it. Let me tell you, I travel this country all the time and I talk to Muslim communities. And I meet Muslims who really want to see that change and that difference take place and have a commitment. But it's one thing to want to do it. It's another thing to have the vision to do it and to know how to do it. And what Muslims need to do is to develop critical masses of Muslims who are trained to have an impact in different areas that are important to the Muslim community. And for those critical masses to actually create a vision and then do something about it. And I'll end with my famous comment, which gets me into trouble, but also which some people like. And that is that the problem that many in the Muslim community have had in the last decade is what I call the couch potato syndrome. We developed this phrase of the couch potato, people who sit and watch sports but don't engage in it. So they sit there and get heavier and heavier as they watch football and say, my God, I love sports, you know? And, and they're sweating as they watch it, getting excited. And when they're all done, they're, and they're sitting there, have you ever noticed how Americans go out and they buy these incredible uh, athletic outfits? I might have some of my students come in. There isn't a drop of sweat or dirt on it, you know? And they have, you know, $200 shoes and these great outfits. And then you sit and you watch the sports, and you know, but you're out of shape and you're watching. Well, the Muslim couch potato is the following. Because I speak to groups, I also do a lot of talks for Muslim fundraisers, and watch, in which I'm doing the, the talk, the non-Muslim. This is what it is. We get together and we talk about the problem of Islam globally. And we talk about Palestine. We talk about Kashmir. We talk about Bosnia. We talk about American neo-colonialism. We talk about the American double standard. We talk about Muslim bashing. And we are upset. And the Muslim community is going to change this. And it needs to change it. And then we break for dinner. And we have a wonderful dinner. It may be <laughs> Iranian, whatever, you know. And then everybody knows if you make it to dinner, huh? What happens? After dinner, you leave within 10 minutes. After dinner, we all go away saying, we feel good. We identified the problems. We showed that we know what they are. And we can really get upset about them. The more upset you get is the more sincere you are. You know? But remember, what the couch potato can't do, and most of you can't do if you don't move, the men, you can't reach for your wallet. You can't go for the wallet 
take out of the wallet what you need to support in order to develop the institutions and do the institution building. And that becomes the critical question. Or you say things like, and I and a number of my colleagues get it all the time. You get emails and letters, dear Professor Esposito, thank you for speaking out in the media. Thank you for writing that op-ed piece. You really need to do more. <laughs> dear Professor Esposito, thank you for creating this, this center in Washington, which has such and such an impact, and you're all over the world. I wish you would create a few more positions for Muslim scholars and get the funding for them. And I say, ah, I should go out to Christians and say, I need another chair in Islamic studies. Christians come up with the money because Muslims, they really want it, but somehow they can't get to it. You know? The challenge of the community then is to develop the vision. You've got the resources and to support that vision. I often say this with regard to communities in Washington. There are some good Muslim groups that are doing terrific work. I was traveling recently in the Midwest, and one of the uh, talks that I gave, people asked to have breakfast the next morning, some of the Muslim leaders. And at breakfast, this literally happened. One of the people, who's a very well-known physician in the Midwest, very bright, he and I get along really well, said, you know that group in Washington, I love the work that they do, but you know, I have a little bit of a problem because the leader of that group during the Gulf War, took a position that I didn't like. I said, there are an awful lot of other Muslims that wanted to see another position. He said, okay, he said, but there was one other thing. We had a conversation once, and his interpretation of one of the hadith of the prophet, I had a problem with. And so I looked at him and I said, how many hadith are there? Uh, have you ever looked at hadith criticism and interpretation of hadith? It's like looking at tafsir of the Quran. There's more than one interpretation. How is any single Muslim going to please you on everything that goes on? And so part of the challenge, as you know, the challenge of Islam to Islam is the challenge to Christians. It's the challenge of recognizing diversity within the community, that the unity of Islam includes a diversity. In Islamic law, we call it ikhtilaf, the differences that exist among the madahib, among the law schools. The ability to accept diversity, the ability to tolerate diversity, not only diversity from religion to religion, but within religion is the only thing that can make the community strong. If you don't tolerate diversity, then there's no debate, there's no discussion. And then you have an experience that I've had, both within Christianity and Islam, and now I will end. This is what I call the Christian, the radical Christian and radical Muslim alternative. Years ago, I went out to lunch with a young man who was studying at a major university who was a born again Christian. And after lunch, he said, you know, I really enjoyed this. Can we have lunch again? I said, sure. I said, if you don't mind having lunch with somebody that you know is going to hell. And he looked at me. And I said, well, you do believe I'm going to hell, don't you? He said, yeah, but I, I, I didn't, because I'm not born again. You know? I said, and you believe your parents are going to hell. They're good Lutherans. They raised you. They're good Christians, etc. But they're not born again the way. And you love your parents. He said, yeah, I love my parents. But they're going to hell, too, unless they're born again. I said, Gee, I read the New Testament, and boy, that's, that's an interesting interpretation of Christianity, okay? Second experience. I was asked to keynote a conference in a major, uh, well, I was asked to key, I, I, I decided not to name the country. I was asked to keynote, because of my friends there, I was asked to keynote a major Muslim conference, let me just say that, overseas, a major Muslim conference. And so I keynoted the conference. And after it, a very well-known young alum got up who's a very, very interesting guy. And he got up and he praised me. To, he said, the speech was wonderful. But watch what was happening. The speech was wonderful. And Professor Esposito, what can we say about you? I mean, you spent 20 or 30 years explaining Islam. You've written these books. Just, just wonderful. I kept thinking, I wish my mother were here. I wish my, and then the punchline came. He said, and, and we love it, despite the fact that you're a kufa and we know you're going to go to hell. <laughs> we hope you will continue to do this for us. And the audience. Half of them laughed, and the other half looked very nervous. And he was speaking, he knew his audience, and he was deliberately driving it home to a conservative wing. And he kept going on, and he said, and he said, come on now, we have to be honest with Professor Esposito. We like him, we'll invite him back again, but we've got to tell him what we exactly think. Well, I will end by saying this, it's not just a question of Muslim to Christian. The danger that I see at times is that those who call for Islamization, 
Some have created a process that I call catheterization. In their enthusiasm to talk about more Islam, if any Muslim disagrees with them, they're kufa, it, you know, they're kafirs. That stifles the kind of free discussion and dissent. And so you have the irony. Those who would complain that they cannot discuss their religion in many Muslim countries without certain regimes coming down on them, when they're in an open society are ready to silence other Muslims who don't speak the way they want to hear them speak. And it seems to me that the challenge in terms of Muslim Christian understanding in the 21st century is that both Christians and Muslims have to allow for the kind of open discussion and diversity, but the communities have to do it. And what does that mean? It just doesn't mean pluralism and tolerance. It means tolerance as respect. Not tolerance as I tolerate you. Because tolerance as I tolerate you can mean tolerance as I have absolutely no respect for you, but I won't kill you. I mean, you know, I'll just allow you to. It means tolerance as respect. That is the challenge, it seems to me. That is the foundation stone for where we need to go. We have to realize that we are a community that believe in the same God and that we are a community that has an obligation because it is that God, for example, in the Quran that said I could have created you as one nation, but I chose to create you as many. It is that God that talks about people of the book. And that should be the theological basis for the kind of vision and for the kind of movement that I think we're all challenged to engage in in the 21st century. Thank you. Uh, Professor Esposito agreed to answer maybe half an hour questions. Yeah, more? we'll do maybe a half hour or less. Or less. Uh, I know some of you have your favorite television shows. I don't so want to get into we have two microphones. If you just uh, walk in with a couple of conditions. No lectures and be as short as possible. Notice everybody sat down when you said the first one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and before you start, I'm going to use my prerogative and ask you the first question. Uh, we've been talking for the last two days about couch potatoes. Okay. My question is if other communities went through the couch potato process and transition, and how the Muslim can look into that, pro that particular yeah. type of community. Yeah, I think that uh, it's, it's very, very interesting. Uh, one of the things that happens when communities come here was an experience that I had as a young man. I was raised in an Italian neighborhood Italian Catholic neighborhood in Brooklyn. And as far as I could walk, it was all Italian Catholics. And it was only when I got older that I began to move into a much more pluralistic setting. And indeed, I also went to Catholic schools and Catholic college. And it was only when I went to Temple University that I really moved into a much more pluralistic setting. Um, but I remember as a young man running into situations as I started to move around the country where I ran into people and I suddenly, after it, would go up to them and say, you're Italian, you're Catholic. And they'd look around nervously and say yes. I'd say, but your name. And they had changed their name. They had changed their name to fit in to the community. As one fellow said, given where I live, I sell insurance, I could never do it. They changed their name, some changed their religion. The in thing used to be become Episcopalian, if you really want to make it in America. You know, I mean, that, I mean seriously, you know, that was the, you know, et cetera. Um, so that community faced that situation. It would seem ironic to you, but the community that I think shares the most with Muslims at one level is the Jewish community, when it came, because it was a very small minority, and it remains a very small minority of the community, coming into an overwhelming, a society that defined itself not as Judeo-Christian, but as Christian. Judeo-Christian, that term is pretty much a post-World War II term. So that before, people simply would have described themselves who were Christian as Christian, not coming from a Judeo-Christian tradition. And that Jewish community had to figure out how to establish itself. And education became the tool, one of the primary tools. Education and institution building. If you look at American Jewish, the American Jewish community in terms of institution building, just the number of American Jewish groups that do fundraising, it's phenomenal. Let alone if you look at the fundraising that they do, the amount of money, okay? That's one. Number two. I can tell you that there are more chairs in Jewish studies in the United States than there are competent scholars to fill them. The community is ready to move into that. 
building synagogues, building schools, etc. It's that kind of institution building. I think one of the problems that the Muslim community faces is that many Muslims come from countries where the government built the mosque or local wealthy families. So the, the, the idea, you know, that the government and the institutions were all taken care of, you know? And the idea that one is going to talk about the kind of uh, support and the kinds of projects that need to be supported, it is beyond their comprehension. I remember once uh, raising uh, money for, we have it at Georgetown, a chair for Islam in uh, Southeast Asia. And it was funded by uh, Malaysian businessmen. And I remember meeting with one of them, and he said to me at one point, Professor, you know, you're talking about two, $2.5 million. That's, that's a lot of money. And um, his friend turned to him and said, but each of us is being asked to give 500000 and you would be willing to spend more than that to bring Disney World here. In other words, it's a corporate venture. And the fellow sort of thought for a second and smiled and said, you're right. And everything moved quickly forward. So I think that the community has other places to learn from, but I think the community is also getting to a point where the community is ready to move, to do it. The microphone. <clears throat> Better go. If you speak to the microphone, it's better because they can hear you. And uh... Indeed, it was a delightful speech. I am very sorry that a certain person called you a kafir, but he was a certain person. He was not a scholar mm. of international repute and fame, but as a student of Oxford, London, and Cambridge University, I had a professor, Alexander Hamilton Gibb, Mm. And he wrote a very famous book, Mohammedanism. Mm. Now, to us Muslims, Muhammad is not the originator of Islam. He is mm. not the originator of Mohammedanism. And many books in the libraries here, public libraries, they say Muhammad founded Islam and Islam preaches in fidelity. Mm. Islam preaches kufr and kafiri. Mm. Sir, so if intellectuals take up that approach, what to speak about a Malvi who called you a kafir? I'm not justifying mm. him. Mm. Mm. Another small thing I want to say is that you said at one stage that there are more mosques than Muslims in some towns. I thought you said it out of joke. It was just mm. an exaggeration. Mm. Mm. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, with regard to your first point, yes. Um, with regard to the first point, um, you're right about that problem, but I think that you will find that in the last 10 years, there are many more uh, scholars um, and certainly many more, I think, books that correct that, um, that problem of, of that perception of Islam. But that still remains a challenge. It still remains a challenge. But the reverse challenge is there too. The challenge for Muslims is to learn about Christianity and Judaism. I mean, there are, there are more people in America who study Islam than there are Muslims who study Christianity. And if communities are going to understand each other, particularly the leadership of communities, the ideal is when people can get together and not, know not only their own faith, but the faith of the person they're talking to. We go that way. Okay. Uh, thank you for the speech, Professor. My question is uh, on <coughs> Judeo-Christian Islamic relations, which I don't think you really touched on. Uh, in that the problem of Israel and Palestine, I see that as a stumbling block between American Islamic, Christian Islamic relations. And uh, so I'm wondering how do you mm. see this stumbling block being overcome? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think that it's, it's a stumbling block at a political level, but uh, not necessarily at a religious level. It is with certain elements of the religious right, but it is certainly not. If you look at the statement, for example, of the National Conference of Catholic Bishops on the Middle East given as far back as five and six years ago, uh, and indeed, there are many groups of, of Christians and Muslims, uh, Christians, Muslims, and Jews, but Christians and Muslims that I happen to know, you know, uh, who have spoken out quite strongly on issues like Palestine and Jerusalem. Uh, but at a political level, yes. I mean, I think that uh, the reality of it is, um, um, uh, my, for example, I mean, I often don't say this publicly, but, you know, he is video. It is, yeah. Well, it isn't publicly, right. 
you will all forget what you hear. Um, I mean, it's not that significant, but my center is called Center of Muslim Christian Understanding. And that's because of the, the, the people who originally established it, what they wanted to do. Now, we do have symbols of all three faiths in the center, carved uh, in Bethlehem. But some have said, why don't you also have Judaism as part of that? And uh, part of the answer that I will give is, is simply that what we do is what we do, just as there are groups that do Judeo-Christian, but also that until Palestine is resolved, one cannot talk about this kind of uh, official, uh, I think, trialogue in the kind of effective way in which one would want to. So I think that you're right. I mean, it, it, is, it is a stumbling block. Yes. Um, you talked about relationships, education being certainly one of the primary ways in which to build those. My question simply is, you speak that the Jewish community certainly has moved to a certain level where they are now empowering and have empowered themselves. APAC and groups like that are very well known. The Muslim community, you feel, is, is getting to that takeoff stage, if we can use that terminology. What do you see coming in the next, perhaps, decade, give or take, if the Muslim community is able to reach that takeoff stage and successfully empower itself, vis-a-vis -vis other groups in, this, in the United States, certainly, if not worldwide, will they be able to impact the way the media portrays, certainly the Muslim community, and other communities of religious and ethnic origin, and try to reach that dialogue and that understanding on a greater level that you speak about? Do you think that's possible? I, I do. I mean, I think that, um, you know, we already have, for example, uh, today, the, 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 the number of dialogues that go on at, at, lo at local community level, you know, between communities and among uh, officials, but also at the official level, you know, uh, b uh, between the National Conference of Catholic Bishops, let's say, and Muslim groups. Uh, there are dialogues being held not only in Washington, but uh, in, uh, with ISNA uh, being held in New York, you know, et cetera, at that level. Uh, the political empowerment groups, it's more difficult. Uh, one of the things that uh, Muslim groups seem to share in common is um, that it, it's like, you know, when I was a kid, I used to, uh, play around uh, a little with magic, and you would get like one little rabbit, and you would squeeze it, and there would be three and four and five. Well, that's what Muslim groups do, you know? You establish a Muslim group, and within three months, you got two and three, not because they're growing from strength, but because they're an argument, they break away, they, and so that's gonna be the challenge also, you know, that ability to work together. The second is, and you ask most Muslim groups and most Arab groups this, when do they get the funding when there's a crisis? You know, then the support and the funding, and then when it passes, Things drop off. I mean, I'm talking about whether I talk to, uh, if you will, uh, Arab groups that are non-religious, or if I talk to the, uh, um, uh, gosh, it's a, I'm very good friends, the American Muslim Council and other groups. The funding will go up when there's a crisis. That's not a community that deals from strength. Strength is that, you know, that you, you do institution building so that when there's a crisis, the institution is there and strong, you know? And I think that, that that's part of what the, what the challenge is. Uh, professor, I enjoyed your talk. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. Uh, professor, uh, uh, your tone has been quite uh, optimistic and has been very uh, upbeat. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to uh, bring an issue that, a uh, couple of issues mm. that are, uh, uh, let's say, they're negative. Mm. Number one, in your neck of the woods, over in Loudoun County, from what I understand recently, there is uh, an issue regarding uh, getting a variance for a school uh, for Muslims. I don't know if you've heard about it or not. You probably have. I've been have. involved in it. It's been oh. resolved. They, it's been approved. Uh, yeah. One of the people that uh, that was against uh, against having a mm. school in, in Loudoun County, a, uh, a pastor, I believe. Mm. Yeah. Well, he made an interesting point. Uh, or a point that a lot of people recently make it find it very interesting and that is that you know Christians and those who convert from Islam to Christianity are being persecuted in the Islamic uh, countries and some of them are even put to death now how do you see that kind of relationship outside of the United mm -hmm. States outside of the West how do you see that uh, that having an effect on the lives of Muslims who live here in the United States. And as you mentioned, mm. they, every day they find many, many things in common with, the, uh, with their mm. Christian and Jewish uh, neighbors, mm. number one. The other thing, uh, Professor, is that how do you see, finally, uh, the author of the piece of trash, uh, 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 the satanic verses, yeah. how do you see that uh, play out uh, 
in near future, hopefully. Mm. Uh, well, with regard to the first, oh yeah, in Loudoun County, uh, the uh, the desire uh, was and is to build an Islamic school that would educate some 3,500 students. It is being funded solely by Saudi Arabia to the tune of 75 million dollars. Um, the, uh, the the Saudi Academy uh, tried to uh, move into another community to establish itself a couple of years ago. And I, uh, I wasn't following it a couple of years ago, and it was prevented. In Loudoun County, everything looked fine, and then all of a sudden, you had a number of people in the community come forward, including this pastor, um, who uh, at one point, and then he, then he mellowed and became, uh, at least came up with a kind of rational argument. But initially, I was called one night and, and told that there was a pastor who was threatening to turn out 4,000 people who, would be, who was against this and was even uh, you know, th being threatening. Then later on, he said, oh, no, no, people misunderstood me. It's nothing against Islam. And he gave this example that, that in fact, overseas, uh, those, A, that Christianity at times is not allowed to, to function uh, or flourish, but also that where Muslims convert to Christianity, some are uh, persecuted or killed, etc. cetera. Um, there is no doubt about the fact <clears throat> that those kinds of events overseas, you know, if you have, for example, a radical group in the name of Islam that goes into a Christian town in Egypt and uh, burns a church or kills people, etc. Uh, and if that makes the headline events, um, or if a woman is uh, stoned to death um, uh, in, a, uh, in, in a village uh, in, uh, in Iran, and that story is, is put in the newspapers and played a certain way, uh, that has an impact. You know, I mean, that is people sitting here will say, you know, this must be what it's all about. Now, uh, there, I have two observations. Number one, the role of the Muslim community, it seems to me, in America, is to respond to those things that it sees as Islamic and not Islamic. In other words, to speak out where it sees religion as being manipulated, okay? And step forward and do that, rather than, as sometimes happens, not always, but sometimes, remaining silent, okay? The second thing is, though, is that the challenge to many uh, 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 non-Muslims in America and in the West is to respond to events in the Muslim world or with, uh, in Muslim communities the way it responds to events in the Jewish and Christian community. That is, if you have a Christian group like David Koresh's group or Jonestown and it commits an event, nobody says that's what Christianity is about. They say they're a bunch of extremists or nuts who are doing that in the name of Christianity. You know, if. Um, uh, a Jew walks into the mosque in Hebron, as happened, and does what he does, most people don't say that's what mainstream Judaism is about. They say that's what a fanatic form of it is. You see. Unfortunately, often, it's changing, but often when something would happen in the Muslim world, that kind of distinction wouldn't be made. You know, between an extremist who manipulates religion and commits something and says, you know, this religion, and what the mainstream faith is about. That part of the equation, I think, gets resolved as people come to understand Islam more, and as, uh, as Muslims also are more present in society and speak out more on the issue. Now, let me make it clear. If I sound upbeat, it's only because I have a certain philosophy of life, which is that the only way you change things is that you change things. The only way that you change things is that you have a vision of change and that you pursue it. It doesn't mean you're going to achieve all that you wish to change. If I sound upbeat, it's because I have seen changes in the last 25 or 30 years. Things have gotten better at one level. It doesn't mean that they're great. And I can tell you that if you sit in my seat, in my office, in Washington, I deal with the garbage side of it regularly. But the media does call. The media does ask. 10 or 15 years ago, they would just print. I can tell you right now that a major international network called me about two weeks ago. How they found me, I was at my mother's house. They found me and they called solely for the reason of framing that issue. You remember there was a, a report that a number of radical groups uh, had come together and called for the killing of Americans and Westerners overseas under Ben Ladin's leadership, et cetera. There's this whole thing. This major communications outfit called me up and said, we want to understand this story better so that we can frame how we're going to respond both tomorrow and the next few weeks. That never would have happened before. On the other hand, 
you have a lot of other stuff out there that's still a problem. And on the Loudoun County, I can tell you that. Professor, excuse me. Yeah. In New York Times, have on that very story, I'm sure you've seen it. They had it. They had it. Muslims are going to be t uh, killed all over the world, and I just that Muslims believe. will kill all over the world. Yes, yeah, yes. yes. And I just couldn't believe it, but. It, Whatever the news organization, but I'm sure it was in New York Times. No, it was CNN. Yeah. But, but even with the Times, realize, okay, who's also making the problem? It's not just the New York Times. It's the fanatics that are saying it. You know what I mean? It's the extremists that are saying it, and that plays into what the problem with the media is. On the Loudoun County, that has been resolved, A, and B, I can tell you that uh, the Washington Post is doing a major Sunday story on it, I don't know what it'll look like, so I can't take you know, responsibility, but I can tell you that that reporter is spending weeks, not only, I mean, he called me up not only to interview me, he asked me to give him the names of Muslims all over the place. Newsweek and US News and World Report are going to have cover stories on Islam in America, and I know for a fact they have gone out of their way to interview Muslims all over the place, including Muqtadr Khan. Yeah, five minutes, go ahead. Uh, my question, uh, uh, thank, first, thank you very much for your informative speech. Um, you mentioned that historically there has been cooperation uh, between Muslims and Christianity and Judaism uh, in like 10 centuries back. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it gives me the impression that at the beginning there was good relationship that lasted for several centuries and suddenly something happened that uh, brought animosity or something that is naturally to think of it is artificial. I would uh, appreciate if you shed some light on that. Mm. And in the light of this question, it comes to a second question, which is because we don't want to live in the past, mm. as you mm. mentioned, we, it addresses the situation in today. Um, you know, you mentioned that Muslims have good relationship with neighbors, mm, you know, mm. they are engineers, doctors, mm. professionals, mm. serve the society. And uh, you see there is a kind of uh, animosity that is uh, uh, something not natural that faces Muslims against Christianity that is not a natural mechanism within mm. the two religions. I would appreciate if you shed some light uh, on that uh, an artificial uh, uh, that artificial uh, mechanism of uh, animosity, and um, uh, in the light of the answering to these questions, could you um, elaborate on? when you know these differences disappear hopefully by mutual cooperation uh, what benefits mm. muslims would bring to western societies i think that um lest lest i be misunderstood in the early centuries there was both conflict and cooperation not one or the other there was both conflict and cooperation and i think that exists today conflict and cooperation uh, what I'm talking about is where we have to go in terms of moving on in the future. And it seems to me that part of the challenge, for example, of non-Muslims in America is to realize, as I said earlier, that Muslims are us, that Muslims are second, third, and fourth generation, that Muslims are Americans. The challenge to some in the Muslim community is to figure out how they want to define being Muslim in America. That is, it's not just a question of living in America, it's living with others in America. It's not just a question of being here, it's a question of, of the with. How do Muslims participate in the political system? How do Muslims uh, not only preserve the sense of identity and community, but also interact with their neighbors as neighbors, not just in the workplace, but in the neighborhood? Yeah. I have, hold on a second. I, I have to just make a, a procedural point here. We only have about, maybe about four minutes. And I'm, hold on please. I'm going to give the chance to the ladies to ask the, to ask two questions, if you don't mind. 
I'll make it very brief. Um, you spoke that uh, the American, the image of the American Muslims has been influenced largely by events outside the United States or beyond the United States. Is there any such image of American Muslims within the Muslim world? Is there, are there any expectations of American Muslims in the numerous countries that you've visited? Yeah, it's, it's a very uh, interesting and ambivalent kind of thing. In some Muslim countries I go to, in some Muslim communities, people sort of, some people worry and say, uh, you know, my God, they're going to lose their Islam. They're going to lose their Islamic identity, you know, in America. Uh, in others, no matter where I go now, I'm always asked, even though I don't go there to lecture or to talk on Muslims in America, I'm always asked to speak about Muslims in America and answer questions. They wonder, uh, those that don't know, what's happening here? Uh, uh, are Muslims growing and, and thriving uh, as a faith? Are they accepted? Are they not accepted? Uh, to what extent do events in the Muslim world impact on the way they are, uh, the way American Muslims are perceived here? I think all of those things, uh, you know, play out. Yeah. Uh, yes, I really appreciated your speech tonight. And I'm very happy that being a Christian, you have been able to bring up the main problem that we have here about having masjids all separated because of nationalities that took a Christian to have to bring it up to us because we've tried and we haven't succeeded. Um, also, I wanted to know that uh, when you speak to Christian groups, um, do you ever suggest to them to read Quran, to learn about it, uh, so they can see really what Islam is about, not what they perceive from the people? We had a meeting about a year ago with a rabbi, a priest, and a Muslim leader. And the priest informed us that Catholics did not know about our Quran because of ignorance. And we know as a fact that the Vatican really doesn't want our Quran to be out there too much mm. because it's not beneficial to them. Uh, do you ever suggest for them to just sit down and read our Quran and see what similarity it has to all of the uh, revelations that God has sent to us? And to see that, you know, we're not just something from outer space, mm. that we're something that's real, mm. and it's just the completion of mm. what God sent to uh, man. I mean, what I would point out uh, to many in the audience is that the vast majority of people in the United States who study Islam and study Quran are probably not Muslim. So that, that's a beginning point. I mean, the fact is there are an awful lot mm. of people out there of Christian and Jewish backgrounds mm. who choose to take courses and study it. One of the great ironies is that uh, uh, Muslims can be very much like um, other ethnic groups and other, uh, other groups, African Americans and Italians and Hispanics. They will on campus insist on having Hispanic studies or Italian studies or whatever and want professors, but the students from that very background will often not be the kids who wind up taking the courses. So number one, that does go, uh, does go on in classrooms. Number two, to be quite frank, the way I suggest that people approach uh, Islam is to first read a little bit about Islam and to read the Quran then with that. If they just pick up the Quran, given the way most people read the Bible, I don't have time to get into this, but mm -hmm. structurally, the Quran, as you know, is not laid out from cover to cover, we go this way, mm -hmm. as the Bible would be. And so people can actually be initially very confused and it can uh, uh, not be beneficial for some if they have a little bit of background so that they then know what they're moving to and looking for, then I find they can engage the Quran much better. This isn't true for all people, but I think it's true for many. Mm -hmm. I have one question from one of the sisters in the back. She says, how can we as Muslim women fight off the racism and prejudice that we face every day regarding our hijabs? Well, uh, that's, a, that's a really tough one. I think though that Muslims are, face, are facing it here, both here and in Canada. I mean, there have been, as you know, if you, if you look at uh, messages from CARE and other places. Uh, where this discrimination takes place, there is increasingly a response to it. Uh, the situation here is a, is a heck of a lot better than it is in France in terms of the hijab, mm -hmm. and it's better than it is in Turkey in terms of the hijab. I, uh, I think the way in which it occurs, I think the way in which it occurs is that uh, Muslim women have to continue to wear the hijabs and to be able to stand up for their rights much as, uh, I make this as, only as an analogy, and uh, I always tell my students my analogies are terrible, but much as um, uh, women uh, of my generation and, and, and women like my wife, wife had to establish themselves in, in, in a society that was willing to have problems with 
their presence in the society and how they functioned. And I think the hijab is something that people, as Muslims become more prevalent, they will simply get used to. My God, if we can get used to wear, seeing all these crazy kids walking around with baseball hats and males with earrings, sorry to all the males with earrings, but having had long hair and worn be beads, I thought that was normal. Wearing an earring, I can't get used to, so I can denounce that. But I think, I think that the scene is changing. We see more and more women wearing hijabs. And as we see more and more women wearing hijabs, we'll become ad adjusted to it. Thank you very much. One more question. OK, uh, earlier you commented that uh, the American awareness of Islam came about during the time of the Ayatollah. I wanted to comment, uh, ask you the question, do you uh, basically discredit the grassroots movement of the African Americans as, con as a contributing factor to the spread of Islam Absolutely. in America? Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you really think that's what I, what I believe? Huh? Do you really think that's what I believe? Well, you said the awareness came about basically. You, the awareness, you know, more Americans the found awareness, out about Islam the awareness came, when that came about. The awareness came era. clearly. Let me be really flat out about yeah. it. The awareness came at a national level. It came from the Iranian Revolution. Mm -hmm. At local level, it came from an engagement with the Nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. But that engagement of the early period of the Nation of Islam simply reinforced the negative image. Because in fact, as you know, in the early period of the Nation of Islam, it was a, an Islam that was presented, an Islam that was divided along racial lines, yeah. that was exclusive, et cetera. And so, but the Nation of Islam was not experienced throughout uh, America in the same way that the Iranian Revolution was. It was. That was experienced as a domestic situation. And, and for many Americans, they never, extrapolated, because I happen to be in graduate school when the Nation of Islam was very visible. They never uh, extrapolated from that and, and made big connections with the Islam that was out there in the broader Muslim world. I don't, well, I don't at all yeah. take away from the, the contribution or the role that African American uh, Islam has played in terms of the development of Islam. Well, I understand that point, but we, the transition was, was made and whereby it became global after That's the period right. of 75. Yep. Yep. And it was a, a grassroots movement that really contributed to the That's spread right. of Re Islam. Read the fourth know, edition America. of my book, Islam it, the Straight Path. No, okay. <laughs> Sorry, read the third edition. There is no fourth edition. So in order that the guys would not get upset, maybe just one more question. I'm not upset. Go ahead. Thank you very much. I've read your Islamic uh, your Islamic threat, myth, or reality. And uh, it would have been more appropriate to ask Rabbi Mir Kahani, but I prefer because you're here, I'm going to be asking you. You, uh, you exposed uh, how the average American was exposed to uh, Islam here. Uh, I would like you to comment on when somebody of the notoriety of Dr. Henry Kissinger on TV, alive with Ted Koppel. Ted Koppel says, now I can rest. This was in the aftermath of uh, the Gulf War. Now I can rest. We have pushed Iraq 100 years back. Thank you. Uh, you know, it, it's like when people used to ask me to explain Ronald Reagan's policy. So, you know, why the United States bombed Libya? I didn't do it. Um, <laughs> I think that, uh, I mean, to put, it, to put it as bluntly as I can, um, and because this is being videoed, I can't use the language that I used to use to describe both uh, Saddam Hussein and Hafez al-Assad years ago. Uh, but anybody who knows the track record of both of those rulers, at least in uh, Hafez al-Assad's younger years, he may have mellowed in his older years a bit, uh, and certainly Saddam's years, uh, these are not people that you would want to sit down and have a meal with and expect to be able to hold your meal down. Um, <laughs> And the problem is, therefore, that for many people, uh, uh, the way in which the Gulf War was constructed okay, was seen in terms of Saddam. In other words, just as Saddam, rather brilliantly, in order to mobilize popular support, did not appeal to his personality and his track record, but appealed to the issues that were of concern to Muslims, in a way a reverse thing happened with regard to Iraq. The reaction with regard to Iraq was to see Iraq in terms of the leader. And indeed, that's the way in which many people approach countries. Most Americans approach Libya in terms of Gaddafi. You know, they approached Iran in terms of, you know, the leader becomes the symbol. And Saddam, and Saddam, you know, the, the, 
the person and the kinds of things Saddam said became the symbol. And the hardest thing, as you know, in terms of turning around uh, uh, policy towards Iraq uh, is, is to get people to distinguish between Saddam and the Iraqi people, and therefore, with regard to the American response, or whatever response is made, to distinguish between the impact of that and who's it really going to affect. There's, there's no doubt about it. If you're talking about Henry Kissinger's response, well, how would I explain a lot of Henry Kissinger's response? Um, you know, I mean, Mr. Kissinger is a man who is, who is brilliant, but one of the lessons you learn is that just because people are brilliant doesn't mean that they're right, you know? Uh, as, as everyone knows, uh, there's more similarity between Islam and Judaism. And then here, God comes and introduces us to Christianity right in between those two religions. And then there's some fundamental issues that are real contradiction, like the concept of turning the other cheek. And then, you know, in Judaism, you know, eye for an eye. And the concept of fasting with Judaism and then Jesus comes is not what you put in your body, but mm. is what, you know, you have to clean mm. your mind. Mm. Not your body, that mm, doesn't, mm, that's not mm, important. And then uh, Islam comes again and preaches about fasting. Mm. This has made me confused mm. a little bit. I think that the only way in which you can really get at that is that you've really got to look at these traditions and study them comparatively. Fasting exists in all three traditions. Right, exactly. Particularly, it's very strong in, in, in brands of Christianity. I mean, the, certainly the Catholicism I was raised in. Like eating had, pork, you know, Christians eat pork. No, I mean, no, but Christianity had, had very, very strong periods with regard to periods of fasting. So I think that there, uh, um, I, I think that the kinds of similarities and differences you're talking about, while in some cases, something exists in one faith and not in the other. Often, uh, it does actually exist in more than one faith, but we just, it depends on which group in that faith you know, one talks to. All right, uh, I commend your how-to on how to get us to move forward, but if we take on the uh, action that you're suggesting, which is go through these political action committees and go to the lobbying process and so on and so forth, it seems like a long-term effort in order to get to the stage that uh, of democracy. And democracy as we know it here <clears throat> wiped out the state of Palestine. Democracy was uh, implemented in Algeria. It, we see what happened there, genocide. And same thing now with Turkey. And I don't want to wait another 50 years to sit here and make an impact in the United States, and I am born here, mm -hmm. and I was a Catholic, to make an impact here in the United States just to watch my family be wiped out. Mm. Let me, let me. Uh, but there uh, is a question behind that. I want, what I want to know is, when you went to these other countries, like Iran and so on mm. and so forth, what did those leaders tell you on how to propagate Islam here and how to institutionalize Islamic mm. uh, infrastructure here? Let me say that number one, what was being cited as problems are indeed major problems. But they are not the product of democracy. They are the product of politics and of the fact that in a democratic system, you elect leaders and those leaders can make decisions. Democracy itself doesn't do that. Uh, that's number one. Number two, when it comes to Palestine, let me tell you a little story. I got into a taxi cab in San Francisco and I knew the cab driver was Arab, didn't know whether he was Muslim, didn't know whether he was Palestinian at the time, but we drove and he didn't say much and we got talking and then somehow I said something, not quite this, I didn't say something like, and speaking of Palestine, what do you think? But I somehow got him going. What I remember so, so tellingly was what he said to me as he pulled into the airport. And he said, as a Palestinian, he said, the people who have let us down are not just the Americans and the Israelis, but other Arabs in particular, and those are the ones that I'm the most upset, upset with, okay? And, and other Muslims. So the reality of it is that indeed the United States and Europe have a, a role to play with regard to Palestine, a role to play with regard to Bosnia, a role to play with regard to Algeria. But, but there have been other players. With regard to Algeria, who was doing it to whom? Algerian Muslims doing it to Algerian Muslims. And I've been very outspoken on Algeria. And Muslims in the area not having a problem with it. The Tunisian government, in fact, plays along with it. So part of the reality that we're dealing with is that we're not only dealing with American foreign policy, and European foreign policy, we're dealing with the dynamics within the region itself. And I think that this is very much an issue. And unfortunately, it's the subject of, a, of, a, of a, another, another lecture. But part of the difficulty today in the 21st century, if we're gonna talk about civilizational dialogue, the civilizational dialogue is one in which often 
It is some of the governments in the region that are, are those who speak in the most militant ways to Western governments and basically say to them, not only our threat, but your threat are the fundamentalists. And so look the other way when there's repression in Algeria or Tunisia or in Egypt. And I think that it's, it's a far more complex kind of, 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 of situation. I don't think democracy is the problem there. I, because I, I'd like to put that word aside and just say political participation, from my point of view, is not a problem. Political participation means that people have a voice. The real question becomes how the dynamics of the politics within that country uh, play out. And frankly, as most of you know, if you're talking about US policy on, to certain countries, it's often formed by leaders in a situation in which the vast majority of the population know very little. You ask the average American about Algeria. Even ask them what's going on in Algeria, and if they understand it, you know, they don't know. So I mean, this is really a, a kind of issue that goes uh, beyond democracy. Thanks to those of you that came and, and that stayed.